the people who make decisions about what law enforcement agencies or military agencies buy for the most part are disinterested it's it's just a thing it's just a tool that they need What's up, everybody? It's always a good day when we get to talk about guns. Today we're going to talk about ARs and stuff, the carbine, the modern-day uh, carbine or the modern sporting rifle. It goes by many different names. The modern-day Minuteman. Oh, yeah. Uh, that voice there was Adam Maxwell. He is joining Mark and I today. You've probably seen the title by now, and we are going to be comparing uh, competition rifles and duty rifles, you know, comp gun versus duty gun, all that sort of thing. Uh, duty gun, you know, just being something that, like, a professional end user would be using, like, uh, it could be mil LE, it could be, like, your home defense gun, too. I think that probably uh, fits the bill for this, right? You know, something that you're well, going to yeah. be using. You know, if words mean things, we, you know, a duty rifle is one that one uses on duty, and we could just, like, spike the mic, and that would be it. There you have it. So... <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, the well, one that's in I your hand. That, well, he's done it. About <laughs> wraps things up, everybody. But thanks for joining us. <laughs> ten, ten minute talk. Uh, <laughs> skip to the next podcast. <laughs> yeah, Adam, uh, you, you were just got. Sorry, now you just got off a plane. You've been up since like two a.m. Sorry, I also just got off a plane. I go. What's wrong with the plane situation? That's a whole different topic. Is is air, airlines and everything here are uh, in shambles. Today's ray of hope was. The first time they actually started boarding from the front to the back again. You like when they board from the front to the back? No, I just saw it as a change oh, towards what they used to kind do. Kind of like a oh. state of normalcy, yeah. if yeah, you will. Yeah, state of normalcy type thing. Well, from a state of logic standpoint. I mean, the, the other way made way more sense. But agreed. Yeah. Unless unless putting too much weight in the back of the plane like makes the plane tip. But I've never seen that, so I don't know if that's a thing. Well, it doesn't make the plane tip when everybody's getting off. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But I <laughs> I do know that they, like, if it's not full, they, like, distribute where people are mm. so that the plane is, like, balanced. Yeah, weight and balance. Yeah. I but. think the front, uh, this would be a good question for, you know, somebody in the airline industry that's making these calls. But I, I just, I always assume that loading from the front is because of overhead space and you're more likely to find space for your carry-on bag and as yeah, more people get on the jet space is reduced and yeah i mean it's in you know off topic but yeah it's the business decision of first class paid the most money they can get on first if they want to and then they have first dibs on overhead bin space mm, right and then then you know first third and then comfort plus and then from know. like an overall experience standpoint yeah. Like, I'd, I'd probably want to be just, like, sitting in the jet less time, though. Yeah, right? Good so, point. Yeah, that's what I always thought. But so Speaking of air COVID, travel. You know what, I'm going private jet. Yeah. Speaking of air travel, uh, back to the uh, back to the old AR-15. Yeah. And, uh, Adam, you deal with, uh, you know, obviously you are in our mill LE sales area, so you mm-hmm. deal with guys that are putting optics on all kinds of different uh, duty guns. And then you also shoot competition a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, yourself, and you are around a lot of people who shoot competition a lot. Now, um, this topic I think is reasonable for a lot of many different reasons because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think uh, one, let's say you have somebody who's your average ordinary citizen, and they want to have a gun that's maybe you know suitable for competition use, but then that they can also use for home defense. That way, they're not spending all the money on like two different rifles, um, you know, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's multi-purpose. Uh, but then also, I think that there is, um, there has been for some time now, I, I think a lot of people have started to address it, but it's still around the stigma is that like competition guns are basically going to get you killed in the streets. Mm-hmm. They're all about flashes and bells and whistles and fancy paint jobs and this, that, and the other thing. And they're basically and they're, a hazard. A yeah. complete hazard, yeah. When it comes to actually anything that's off of. Uh, it's like an elongated bomb, basically. <laughs> Uh, anything outside of a predetermined setup course of fire, they are useless. Yep. Um, now, how about, can you go into this for us? What What's your opinion? What is the difference in the makeup between a comp gun and a duty or like, you know, uh, some sort of like a defense weapon or something like that? Well, I think there's a lot of, um, what's the word? I think both are romanticized into kind of fictitious categories when we're, talking about them hypothetically i think people have kind of uh 
uh, romanticized what a competition gun is and what it can do and what people are actually using. And I think that differs from what people in the top 10 and 20% of the sport are actually using. Hmm. Uh, same as I think people have, especially on the duty side, have greatly romanticized what what a tactical carbine is, what actually gets bought in that name uh, by by uh, government customers and what like people who do that job actually use and then kind of the flip side of what they don't or what they're not really given the option of. Okay. You know? Um, so I think, I think the illusion of both of them is kind of drifted off into some weird quadrant. Um, which, which one would you want to talk about first? I, I've, let's talk about the competition the, guns. The competition guns. Why not? Okay. So in the competition guns, um, um, now we have two right here. Yeah, by the way. I can't tell the difference. Well, Jim, for starters, <laughs> the, they're both scary looking. Well, they're both scary looking because they're, they are fifteens. Because they're yes. of a you know of of a blackened color. Yeah, yeah. It's very scary. Mm-hmm. If we were painting pink, then it would be. These are black guns, actually. But I'm a, the problem is I'm afraid to say that. I, me too. I don't know if maybe we'll. But have, it's out there now. I it can't is. take it back. Um, but and I actually brought these two specifically. Um, uh, to kind of illustrate the point of the median, both these guns started as the same gun. Oh yeah, okay. So um, the the one towards the uh, towards the camera here, this is my primary competition gun, um, and it, and uh, it's the one I use the most often. I shoot it probably the most rounds per year. Um, started life as a as a PWS Mark One Eleven that you can buy. It's a SKU that you can buy at Rainier Arms or wherever. Um, I've changed a couple things on it to suit um, my taste and preferences and the and the game that I play, and then this other one over here also started life as a well is a PWS Mark One Eleven, um, and it's set up slightly differently. I don't do tactical things, but when I uh, am am presenting in and around and to tactical folks, this is what I use. Again, subtle differences. But for the most part, they're eighty percent the same. Yeah. So, um, um, in competition guns, uh, the 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 nostalgia of them is that we somehow use these wildly um, exotic parts. Yeah. And uh, they're somehow doing like like mythological things, and uh, but they're extremely unreliable. So if they get a fleck oh. of dust on them, like it's just over. Right. You know. Which isn't true because, um, I mean, the name of the game is you, you do have to have something that runs the entire match to be the fastest at shooting the match. So anything that's inherently unreliable is kind of a non-starter. Yeah. And usually matches are outside. Where yep, may outside. Be yep. Dirt or dust. Yep. And a lot of the major matches um, or a lot of ranges are actually f- fairly unpleasant <laughs> Air, you know, environments for mechanical devices to operate in. A lot of fine dust, a lot of sand. Um, some of the uh, uh, artificialities of the ranges, uh, the way that the matches run, make the guns prone to uh, to dirt. Example being the the chamber flags. If you're at a range where they make you use chamber flags, okay, well now you got to have your bolt open with this foreign piece of plastic that's probably dirty stuck in it and you probably had to stick that piece of plastic in there while your chamber was still hot so it's starting to melt oh good potentially yeah. um and then you know if we're if we're using a, a competition gun we probably have a fair amount of lubricant on it so now we have an open bolt exposed to the elements and the wind starting to blow dust around and get on you know so it's kind of a recipe for uh what would choke up an ar um so things that are very finicky tend to be non-starters because that's the environment that you're in. So um, while, you know, we were talking about, about uh, rally car racing here before we started the podcast, like similar to, to the motorsports world, they're always pushing the limits of exploring what sort of um, uh, modifications can get us an edge. But as soon as it becomes unreliable or, you know, like it's potentially going to sacrifice your performance – it, it gets it gets benched so yeah in in the competition world you'll see a lot of um, 
uh, exotic buffer systems, uh, exotic springs, um, but they get tested and vetted and they kind of arrive at whatever the happy medium is that's going to work. Uh, you will see lightened bolt carriers. Right. And mm. they've gone to kind of both extremes on those. Um, wasn't too long ago uh, a particular manufacturer was making uh, specifically an aluminum carrier. It Whoa. performed really well, but it was super spooky. It would it would work really well for a set amount of time and then just kind of take a dive. And, you know, the guys who were using that at the time, they were kind of like all about it until it cost them a match they cared about. And then they hucked that thing in the dumpster so fast it would make your head spin. And they went back to a, a, you know, a stainless carrier or okay. something like that. A reduced mass carrier, but not so reduced. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we have optimized the system because... The original AR-15, like we've talked about in some other podcasts, it, it was designed around military specifications. Military specifications go into, it has to cover all the extremes, where when we as a private end user can be like, well, I'm not going to shoot when it's 140 degrees outside, and I'm probably not going to shoot when it's negative 60 outside. I'm probably, even even the most uh, passionate of competitive shooters could probably limit their temperature range to uh, 10 above zero and maybe 100 degrees, which is sure. significant mm-hmm. portions off of what the original was designed for. So we can, start to, we can start to make modifications to the system because we're narrowing the operating window that it has to be within. Hmm. Is that temperature, is that a big factor when it comes to... On um, military stuff? Well... Yeah. Yeah. Well, it on is. on this stuff, like what sort of... Uh, I guess, but I mean... <laughs> Like in the difference in parts, like that that temperature is like, oh yeah, well, you can't. This part's got to be made like this out of this material. That would go to like the gas system. So when the army was originally deciding what the M16 gas system was going to be, they need a gas system that's going to work with the gas pressure that's available from the cartridge they've specified in that given temperature range. Okay. And so the burn rate of the powder can vary that much which is going to vary how much pressure hits that operating system. Oh, yeah. That's okay. right. Oh, we talked about this, temperatures and powders and all that stuff a long time ago. I can't mm-hmm. remember which one, but yeah. Yeah. It was mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh, mind-boggling like, stuff. But, like, yeah. So so if we can, if we can like, accept a few things as given that we're not going to be out on those peripheries, yeah, we can start to optimize this for a specific thing instead of making it a jack-of-all-trades. Sure. Gotcha. Well, that happens in so many things. Every time you try mm-hmm. to make some a jack of all trades, you're in inevitably making yeah. it. Well, I mean, everybody says a master of none, obviously, yep. or yep. Uh, all season tires or no season tires, yep. you know, all that sort of thing. Yep. So you'll see a lot of reduced weight in the receivers and the bolt carriers, um, things like that. But I don't think people at the top of the sport are using as exotic of parts as uh, the 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 layperson on the internet would assume based on what they're consuming. How is it though? Like, I mean, I got to say a lot of times they say when there's smoke, there's fire, that sort of thing. Like somehow these, uh, these sort of fantasies of what it is that the top competitors and stuff mm-hmm. are using. So it had to start somewhere. Oh yeah. And, and I mean, 30 years and ago seen, it was true. Okay. And I've yeah. seen, I, mean, okay. I remember, oh, yeah. I remember looking at like, you'll see parts and a lot of the parts still exist out there. If you look hard enough, you can find them. Where you've got all these just super race like racy looking mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. and you kind of see it, and you're like, "That just looks, yeah." I mean, ridiculous. I got an upper in my basement that barely runs. Yeah, because it was kind of a project that went to that ragged edge, and it cost me one too many times, and on a shelf it sits. You know, um, so mm-hmm. yeah, I would say you know, and a lot of this stuff you know was learned the hard way in the '80s and the '90s. But they learned it one time, yeah. and that carried over. And so you see companies, uh, JP would be a prime example. They, you know, their proprietor was in the sport at its at its you know genesis, and kind of developed these parts in that name. And now what that company puts out now is based on all that lineage mm-hmm. from back then, right. and they're moving forward with it. Right. Um, so I th- I would say they learned a lot of stuff the hard way. And um, there's a lot of people who maybe were in the sport at that time 
and that was their experience with the sport and they left or they're doing whatever they're doing now. But, you know, that snapshot of the sport is what they have and what, you know, if you were a magazine writer, you know, but you went off into the tactical world, well, your last exposure to the shooting sports was back in the 90s and you just kind of assume that it's the mm-hmm. same. Mm-hmm. I mean, so. it's like when you're pushing the limits like that, the, like you don't find out what the limit is until you get there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I do feel like the one thing is, though, so when you talk about competition, you're talking about something that's happening in the private world, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're at a competition, if your gun goes down, you're not going to get shot back at by the steel, right? Correct. So in that sense, you do have some more leeway to try something that's oh, yeah. a little bit crazy, which could yep. be also why it's usually the competition guys that are kind of pushing those boundaries yep. a little bit uh, more unknowingly, maybe something catastrophically mm-hmm. just like comes back and bites him in the butt. Yep. Or maybe it works out awesome. Either way, they go home at night. Yeah. Right. And a lot of those guns were assembled from parts too. Yeah. There aren't there are not very many home built guns in the in the duty side of the house. Good okay. Gotcha. That's a good point. So so a lot of, you know, you can have whatever you want in competition, provided it fits within the rules, but I mean you could order it out of a catalog and put it together. Yeah. You know, and so I think that's a lot of it too. Now, if you go to the tactical side, like the tactical classes, I mean, you probably see this a lot on the edge side of the house. When people bring their guns to classes, the ones that didn't come from a manufacturer have a very high percentage of failure rate of pooping out. Yeah, that's yeah. not that's not being <laughs> ugly. It's just no. It's you talk to talk to any anyone who's been in that realm of of uh, training people it has a large exposure, a sample size of many. They'll they'll say that it, they'll all say the same thing. You know, home built guns fail at a very high percentage. Where a gun built by a manufacturer has a much lower failure rate. Yeah. Um. So, but then, like, kind of getting back to so, what makes a competition gun a competition gun, or what if you look at if they're all sitting on a rack at a stage, what are they all going to have in common? They're probably going to have, um, especially for three gun, they're going to have some kind of muzzle brake. Mm. Um. We're we're only concerned about reducing recoil because more time the sight spends away from the target is time that you can't spend shooting, which is what you're scored on. Um, so we're not concerned about flash. We're not concerned about other people. We're just <laughs> concerned about oh yeah uh, ourselves. Yeah, it's very selfish. Yeah. we're in our, we're in our <laughs> we're in our world, and everybody else is standing back there, and everybody has two layers of hearing protection on. If they're smart, wear two layers of hearing protection. Um, so they're all going to have some kind of muzzle brake. Uh, they're all going to have, they're probably going to have some sort of, uh, enhanced trigger from GI spec. You know, there's a million of them. We've talked about triggers before too, Mm -hmm. but it's going to have some sort of, uh, enhanced trigger just to be cleaner, to brake lighter, shorter reset. Uh, everyone has their preference on what that's going to be. And then they're probably running whatever stock that person's personal preference is. Now you prefer a fixed stock, right? I do. I do. Because you're in competition, there's no need to, there's yep. no reason to collapse it at any given point, Yep, right? yep. Uh, a fixed stock will give you a more solid feel. Um, like it doesn't have the wiggle that you get with the carbine stocks. Um, I can set the length of pull exactly where I want it instead of the five or six pre-positioned detents that I get. Um, and then with a lot of the stocks that I'll choose, you have the option for angling uh, the the recoil pad mm-hmm. and adjusting uh, the comb height, which the more the more you shoot becomes more important to you. Um, so a customized fit is what what uh, we chase there. But For then sure. you know, kind of come full circle on it. Uh, why don't you see that in the tactical side? Well, um, uh, this particular stock, uh, I get about a year or two out of it, and uh, air travel will bend the buffer tube. Air hmm. travel bends the buffer tube. Mm-hmm. What? Yep. Just through, just through, just through getting packed in Pelican cases and getting compressed and whatnot. Um, it it gets bent. This this particular one's actually bent right. I now. was about to say, actually, come to think of it, yeah, that one is bent. Yep. So do you so, leave it in this kind of, uh, you know, customized position when you throw mm-hmm. it in the case? Then. Uh yeah yeah, but I think it's more it's more like the gun getting compressed in this plane oh yeah uh, and then getting dropped and whatever that happens to it after it disappears from the ticking counter but Dang. i have to i have to replace this buffer tube every one or two years 
I've never I've never replaced a standard carbine buffer tube. Um, and it's the threads that that fail in that threaded area. That's oh. just, so hmm. so we're gaining um, fit. We're sacrificing some durability there. I as an end user keep an eye on that, and then uh, now I know the signs of when it's getting. What getting are the signs point. of it? Just uh, it, starts short, it starts short stroking. The, okay. the the bolt carrier won't cycle all the way back. It starts to stick, and then uh, and then it's not long for this world. Okay. And then next thing you know, it shoots a bolt carrier group back into your shoulder because it pounds out of the <laughs> buffer tube. It's usually a good sign. Yeah. Well, it usually it's usually a click, and then uh, uh, pull on the on the uh, charging handle that doesn't go all the way back, and then there's probably a lot of swearing and a, a really bad score. Um, <laughs> but characteristics of a competition gun, um, and then and then. Um, Barrels, barrels. If someone were parting together a competition gun, they would probably spend a lot of money on a barrel. Uh, they tend to be stainless steel because they can cut stainless steel more precisely than a hammer forged barrel. Now that even that gap, that's a little bit. The gap's closing on that too. Mm. Um, but traditionally, a more premium barrel will go in it, and that barrel will have a shorter life um, because uh, a the accuracy standard that it'll be held to. And just the material is not as strong as a cold hammer forged barrel. Now that's kind of like talk about ARs. Is that the same as then say like bolt action guys, PRS mm -hmm. guys, stuff like that? Because I know like for example, Mark on his fancy PRS gun, mm -hmm. he's got a carbon barrel. Nick mm -hmm. Loffenberg was like, oh yeah, you're gonna get a lot of crap from the guys at the competition shoot for having that carbon barrel. And we we're like, why? It's fancy. Everybody likes fancy yeah. things in competition. But then he said, well, because so many people burn through barrels so much. In PRS, he's like a lot of those guys then just go for like a big non fluted hunk of metal that's just cut really nice. Yeah. Well, and those guys also, every time I talk to him, he's like, oh, sweet. You added more weight. <laughs> I mean, they don't even add like components that way a lot. They actually add weights. Yeah. Is there, there's a there's an iconic gun that we have around here. It's a surgeon. You oh, know, oh, yeah. The tan one with yeah. the camo stock. And there's, there's probably a picture of it in here somewhere. It's over, it's over on the wall. There it is. Um, you know that one, how it's got a really short barrel? Yeah, I I asked about that one time. I was like, hey, "What's what's the deal with that?" And they're like, "Well, they just keep rechambering the same barrel, so they shoot the throat out of that gun. He gives it to the gunsmith. They cut the chamber off. They recut a new chamber in it, and then when that barrel gets to a certain length, it's too short. <laughs> new barrel, but they'll get. That's what I was told. I always I, noticed. Yeah, that I thought it was me growing. And the gun <laughs> yeah. was staying the same yeah. because I remember it, that's like, how that that's gun how is long so it's old. been here. Yeah, that gun is so, so old that I yeah. So so Muck and Hearn either thinks I'm really gullible or <laughs> or that's what they do to that one. But I think I think they do. They just rechamber. I think Laufenberg said the same thing. Like they'll rechamber the same barrel a few times instead of just throwing away the whole thing. Interesting. I mean that gun has been at Vortex for ten years maybe it's classic it, at ish. least yeah it, i tell you this and it's been abused and yeah. not cleaned and not yeah and, but it's every time i've seen it man that thing it's shoots lights wonderful. out oh yeah yeah um anyway though so okay so the competition guys like as far as these go they will spend a lot of money on the barrel knowing they're gonna burn the heck through it or they they, they will they will they right. um give it given the choice again like if hypothetically we're talking about somebody who's trying to be in the top 20 percent of the sport okay they're they're gonna spend money on a barrel or a gun that comes with at least a decent barrel or ask for sponsors or, or that. But like <laughs> this this upper's been rebarreled at at it's the original OEM barrel, but I've shot the barrel out of it. Okay, you know, um, and it's okay. been rebarreled, um, just because they do they do get to a point where it opens up, and yeah. then it's just what's your tolerance for pain? You know, I mean, they all any any um reputable manufacturer that probably someone who's participating in the sport would buy. I mean, you could reasonably expect one minute or certainly one and a quarter from an AR. And then when it starts to open up from there, it's kind of like, okay, it's time. Yeah. Um, I, and that seems very reasonable mm -hmm. to me. I actually, this, that one, when it, when it got to that point, uh, the reason it was rebarreled was, uh, the, the barrel extension where the bolt goes in and locks yeah. into the barrel. Um, that had been cycled enough times that it actually peened to the point that it had a sharp burr on it, mm -hmm. and that burr would catch cartridges on its way. They wouldn't feed 
oh, dear. smoothly anymore. And so that's why it was rebarreled because that the peening of that barrel extension there. That's the kind of stuff that you run into once it has an extreme. I was going to say, but like, what do you think? What do you think the round count was at that point, though? Twenty thousand. Yeah, at least. Yeah, a Jamie couple. Christmas. Wow. Um, okay. Now, do we go into optics yet and stuff like that? Accessories we can. and things. Um, I mean, optics in competition is going to be whatever suits the division that right. they're in. So that's kind of that's kind of getting into different classifications of of the game. Uh, I currently I currently shoot in the open division. Open division is unrestricted on optics, and you can have more than one. Uh, that's why this particular one uh, is set up with a uh, a variable power scope, a Gen 3 1 to 10 in this case, and a red dot. Um, the uh, the razor red dot. I like the six MOA. Um, but that's why this particular combination is in here because that's catering to the specific division that I shoot. Um, what, when I shot when limited, you... it would be a red dot. You know. If, Oh yeah. If if it was TAC optics, we would just take the red dot off of here, and it would just be a scope. Yeah. Now, okay. Some people ask this question. This is going to be a little bit of an aside, but some people ask this question. You have open gun here, red dot offset with a low power variable. The low power variable has one power on it. Mm -hmm. So why do you need a red dot that's then also you know basically like one power? It's the very specific application of a course of fire that it's advantageous to have some magnification. But there's also targetry that would make it advantageous to have one power. So we're trying to shoot something very small. In in my world, at to me that's something that's very small at 50 yards or more requires some magnification and targets that are 10 yards and in. So okay. I'm gonna try and shoot the distant target on like a two or a three x, but I don't want to shoot a bunch of really close up stuff on that same power, and it costs time. You don't want to make that yeah. transition. We're, yeah, we're fighting for tenths of seconds. So so everything has a cost. If I can set this at three power and I can have have a uh, you know one power and all I have to do is roll back and forth, yeah. that's where it's advantageous. Um, some people will use the red dot more. Some people will say, I use the red dot for everything 50 yards and in. I don't, I don't subscribe to that because um, when I put it on the timer, I'm always... I'm always faster and more precise using the primary optic. Okay. Just just in the uh, you know in the uh, uh, the fundamentals of how you're holding the gun, it's just less sure. less stable. Um, so if you're, it's less sta- a little yeah. less stable if you're using the offset. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the the offset is kind of a niche thing that helps you cut corners sometimes. Okay. And and uh, the game is about cutting corners, so. Um, if you have it, you use it. It's not something I use a lot or all the time. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Now, you also have in a comp gun here, like you have on the table, uh, your forend is pretty much clear. Yes. There's not, not really anything going on there. Like over there on the comp, or on the, I'm sorry, the, the more duty gun or something mm-hmm. like that, home defense gun, or so, uh, you've got a light going on, might have a laser yep. going on, stuff like that. Yep. This is slick. Yep. And that's not to say you can't have that stuff, um, but, um, you know, uh, there's no free rides. Like, you know, adding weight adding weight to the handguard is, you know, if we look at physics, the further out you put weight on your gun, the more energy it takes to hold up. Mm-hmm. And it starts to affect um, the swing characteristics of the gun between targets. So uh, if I don't need anything out there, I don't put it on. Um, that's not to say like if you have a gun set up like this, you can't have that stuff on there, but it starts to be a hindrance and it starts to be a compromise. Really the only thing I put on a competition gun's handguard is a, a QD sling mount if that particular handguard doesn't already support it. Okay. Oh, okay. I remember, uh, no, you, you just mentioned it there. I know, uh, I remember Ruben mentioned it one time, the swing characteristics of a gun. Mm-hmm. Um, something I have never had the presence of mind to actually pay attention to, to be honest, but that's because I don't shoot as much as you guys do. Uh, I know when we dropped, uh, you know, I remember like four ounces, about a quarter of a pound off the Razor 1 to 6 when we made the E model. Mm-hmm, Ruben mm-hmm. instantly, he was like, oh, I noticed a big difference in how the gun, basically the swing characteristics or something like that. You're mentioning it. That's actually a thing. Oh, that's, yeah. That's like, oh, a, yeah. Uh, that's like a real notable thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How many other uh, top-level competitors would be talking about swing characteristics out there? Are they all talking about it? Oh, we would, yeah. Yeah, well, like, when, like we play, when we play with each other's the dinner stuff, table. yeah. Yeah, no, that's absolutely something that, that they talk about a lot. Um, and then even 
in that it's not just uh it's not just side to side but it's also top heavy i mean this thing turns into kind of like a it's like a sailboat mm-hmm. the heavier it is and the higher it gets the more tippy it gets yeah um so you've yeah got, you've got one of them uh new newfangled high mounts there yes two and two i do th- i do like the the higher mount 2.04 um, inches of height mm-hmm. on the uh on the comp gun and actually on the duty gun, I think yep. I noticed there. Yep. For similar and different reasons. Uh, I mean, I like it higher for an ergonomic reason, especially anybody watching on the video. I mean, my, my head is physically bigger than, oh. you know, on the spectrum. Um, so having the scope higher uh, helps helps with this dimension and of uh, the, between my shoulder and where my eyes at without having to turtle my head down. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, a smaller statured person, combat size, as they say, like in the military world, um, those guys uh, that would be too too tall, you know. So if you're a real kind of a shorter, smaller statured person, that's too high for you. Um, but if if you're on the medium to larger head size um, statured person, the the taller mounts start to have an ergonomic pers- uh, purpose. They were originally designed on the tactical side of the house because we're trying to clear things on the rail, mm-hmm. uh, namely namely lasers, laser mm-hmm. uh, night vision uh, lasers and stuff like that, and getting it high enough to look through with a night vision goggle on a helmet. So when you right. have when you have a helmet mounted goggle, trying to get trying to get down to look through a conventional height optics is very challenging. So oh. adding some height into it adds for. Uh, passive night vision use yeah now that's not normally the way uh things go like you said there, like uh you know the tactical area side of the, th- the house had these high mounts mm-hmm. and the competitive side adopted it now aside from i'll say probably just the base platform being the ar-15 that we use in competition that doesn't happen a whole lot if i'm not mistaken a lot of times you see competition stuff that's absolutely they start, correct. They yep. push the boundaries. They start figuring out things. Well, yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, as much as people are like, oh, that'll get you killed in the streets, it's like 10 years later, they also wind up appreciating that somebody was, you know, crazy enough yeah, to thank, try something. Yeah, thanks for like doing that. the testing. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. But, you know, they push the boundaries. They, they find something. They find something that works. Hey, as it turns out, it's super reliable. Mm-hmm. And then the tactical side of the area. Yep. Yep, the trigger systems would be a good example. Um, you know, all kinds of things were tried in the world of triggers. Ultimately, um, a full auto version of a Geisley trigger is what was adopted by SOCOM. So you won't see it in in regular army, but if you look at SOCOM units guns, they tend to have a specific variant of of hmm. trigger in it that is much enhanced from what USGI would be. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You kind of touched on the exa- on the exception to that. The, the high mounts were developed for a very specific military application. A couple members of the Army Marksmanship Unit used them in three gun when the game went through an evolution where that became advantageous. It was a faster, more TV, made for TV format. Mm -hmm. So they started using it and then it caught on from there. But yeah, usually it goes the other way. Usually, usually, I mean, the handguards followed over. If you look at um, Mm. like block three of the M4 with the new, uh, the new Geisley rail that that's being integrated into the latest generation of M4s. That's an evolution out of, you know, the commercial sector evolving handguards, and they're the one that won. Um, uh, stocks, the same same way with stocks, the commercial market made made various types of of, um, of uh, butt stocks, charging handles, ambidextrous charging handles all evolved right. quite a bit. Yeah, all that stuff developed out of the competition world, and then. Uh, guys found ta- practical applications for it because the game is ultimately a practical application of a rifle. So, yeah. would you say that's kind of what's happening too with the low power variable? Yes, is that kind of a commercial area competition side of things? And then now we're seeing that. I mean, it's like the, it's the, like the thing in optics now. The genesis of it was was tactical. Uh, that comes out of uh, Mogadishu in '93. Okay. Got it. Um, it took a while for the product to develop, and um, for it to be kind of accepted and a big component of it being accepted in the tactical world was both tactical people playing in the competition sports and then a long proven track record of solid performance in the competition world kind of made it inevitable that there was something that we would have to look at. But yes. What what aspect of that Mogadishu event, whatever you want to call it, was like, oh, we need some low power variables. 
Um, well, anybody who's seen the movie Black Hawk Down, right? right so they're they're fighting in a city, um, and they they uh, uh, ran into a lot of angry people uh, shooting at them in and around uh, people who uh, like the famous scene of the movie. Uh, Be careful what you shoot at, because people do live there. So they couldn't just shoot into crowds. They had to they had to pinpoint people and shoot them. So they um, uh, Delta Force saw a need for a magnified optic where they were, at the time, they had very primitive aim points on top of carry handles. Right. Um, Right. So they wanted some sort of magnification system. So this is somewhat... The original high mount. Yeah. So this is where, like, the Picatinny reels started coming from, or the flat top receivers started coming from. And initially they put out a uh, a solicitation for a low-power variable scope and really the only thing that was on the market at the time was the Schmidt and Bender short dot. Um, and it was a very niche scope at the time. Uh, the in, the industry, like the, the optics industry, wasn't convinced that there was enough demand for something. Or they hadn't really thought about it very much yet. Mm-hmm. And they kind of had other things cooking. So it took a while for something to really develop along those lines. But the short dot was on the market, so it did get used. And it started developing... Um, and then um, I think I talked to Sam a little bit about this when I was your your brother Sam uh, about this when uh, we were talking about so where did like the Gen two Razor one to six come from? That was one of the first ones that really made the one to six go tactical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Before before the Gen two one to six, there were others. There weren't very many. And the ones that were out there were more like African safari scopes. Oh, sure. Like a, dangerous, yeah, yeah. like a dangerous game type scope. They were a dangerous type game type scope. They hadn't been ruggedized and tacticalized yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But those were the basis for what, what right. kind of... Did they ever tell you that. what the Razor Gen One One to Four was? That one, that thing was just confused. I had, I had I, one. I have one still, and I yeah. love it. But it's also a confused scope. I don't yeah. think I knew what it was. Well, there was yeah. two versions of it too. Yeah, three. Three, yeah, Jeez, yeah. It was a one good. to four. It was first focal plane, tall, exposed, turrets. illuminated with ginormous turrets. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the rifle scope repair guys if they could put one to six turrets on that scope because then it would be awesome. <laughs> but they were like, no, no, it can't, uh, can't be done. Yeah, um, cool. Okay, but that's I mean, so yeah, boils down to really what a. Uh, LPVO, 1X variable, whatever you want to call it, excels at in mm-hmm. a lot of ways is speed and precision and target ID, mm-hmm. which sounds yep. like that's yep. pretty important in yep. a lot of yeah. scenarios. Usually you say you, you can't you can't eat your cake and have it too or whatever, you know, where it's like, oh, yeah, you can't be able to shoot up close and shoot at far distances. In this case, you actually can. The only yep. thing you, you know, sort of give up is size and weight, but then yep. again, that is even like in comparison to what? In comparison to a red dot? Yes. In comparison to a 3 to 18? No. Yeah. Right. So, uh... Chicken or the egg, I'm not sure, but I know like in the in the 90s, early 2000s, and there were there were those like fixed power ACOGs with the, the red dot mounted on top. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that was a military thing, you know, that carried over, and guys were using that and it was kind of a cool guy thing. They started getting beat by people using these dangerous game scopes, and that that switched the paradigm in the sport. And then, contextually, there's a there was a, a shooting war going on. So guys from the military community were playing in three gun, and they saw these scopes, and they too got beat with right. you know with their military stuff. They're like, what's that? And then they started bringing it over, onesie twosies, and then it was entire teams, and then you know it kind of and the guys, from there. the guys that were those original ones using those dangerous game low power variables, they were like, I just picture the guy from Jurassic Park, who's like Jurassic Park one, and oh. he's, you know the guy with the gun, yeah. And he came over and he was like, yes, you know, military units need to be using something like this. <laughs> uh, that was him. His name's Brian Payne. He wore, he, at the time, he wore a visor, not a hat. He wore a visor because his hair was fabulous. Wow. If anyone who knows him is listening, they appreciate that. That's bad. <laughs> uh, comp gun. Or no, no, duty gun. See, now I'm getting him mixed up again. Because... <laughs> Because we talk in circles. We talk in circles. But then the other thing was, you know, I think that we are seeing now less and less of a 
difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, or maybe maybe it's not even so. Maybe there always wasn't even that much of a difference, like you alluded to before. Maybe people had these grandiose ideas in their head where it was like competition guns are oh. all just like space guns, and then duty guns are more like real. A little bit, I think. What I don't think most people understand about duty guns, like real duty guns, guns that are used by law enforcement professionals, military professionals, security professionals. What they don't understand about a lot of those, and even I learned some of this as I got into it from a sales aspect. Um, We, on the private side, or as enthusiasts, like anyone listening to this podcast is interested in guns to the point where they're an enthusiast. Yeah. So it's a cool thing to them. The people who make decisions about what law enforcement agencies or military agencies buy, for the most part, are disinterested. It's it's just a thing. It's just a tool that they need. Yeah. So when we make a purchasing decision about a gun, we're talking, we're like, the the boxes are like, I want the stock that fits me. I like this grip. I want a certain trigger. It's got to fit this price point. I don't want to... I want the M lock handguard. Got to look know. cool. Yeah, I'm mm. thinking 11 inch. You know, um, that's their 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 uh, their Venn diagram or their pie chart. That's that's what the slices are. All of that that entire pie chart of what the private person would consider when they're buying a rifle is 30 percent of that decision. Everything else, and I mean everything else, is budget and politics and um service service life parts things like oh, that when it comes to like somebody choosing yeah guns for like yeah. government or yeah whatever duty. so yeah so it's um it's um can our people use it is it too complicated for them to use will it withstand them neglecting and abusing it um from like a disinterested you know uh pick pick something in your life that you don't take good care of um, I'm struggling for an example, but, um, uh, most, most people's phones, most <laughs> people's phones. Over at Mark, like there's a few things I could say, but yeah. I think they'd get me. Yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, most people's phones, uh, their phone prop, most, I, I would say the, most people, I fed the dog? their, your phone isn't out of arm's reach very often, but I mean, how many people do you know have a cracked screen on their phone? Plenty. Mm, you know, or, you know, things, things like that. Do you, do you reboot it? as much as you should do you always do the update when you should no but a lot of that translates over like us as enthusiasts why wouldn't somebody clean their gun why wouldn't you just wipe it down with oil every once in a while why wouldn't you give it the update yeah why would yeah exactly (laughs) so that kind of stuff um and then budgetary you know it's uh you know what meets the specification it's pass fail what meets the specification and as soon as it meets specification what's the lowest price um, and then when you're talking about an agency picking up 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 of these, they start to be like, well, what, what is parts like? What is service like? You know, who do we call? Do they have armors? Can you train our armors? Things like that. Well, yeah. And you look at like this stock that's mm-hmm. on the duty gun versus the one that's on, you know, your, your comp gun there, mm-hmm. you know, probably for them, it's like. This one fits your face perfectly. Yeah. They, like, which one fits the most faces? Yeah. Which one fits everybody's face? Yeah. And like, is cheap. Pretty good. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's And that's where something like this comes from. So, has has some some cheek weld, you know, enhancement in it, but six positions. You know, everyone can probably find one of those six that, that yeah. fits them pretty close. So, um, in the duty gun side of the house, it's not really about the gun is my main point for the most part um it's does it meet spec what does it cost what's the support system and then it's the biases of the people involved in the decision both on the sales side and on the command side you know do do you like the guy from brand x do you not like the guy from brand y which do you think you're going to buy from you know um that's what goes into um duty gun uh purchase decisions and then there's even a hierarchy scale of there's there's the ones uh there's a government program where they can get leftovers from the military basically free oh yeah on loaner uh, a lot of rural communities have those so they're yeah, that's like, why sometimes you'll just see like a cop driving an mrap similar it's the same program yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but like, you know, that's where, how you have like departments using Vietnam era M16s as their patrol rifles because they got them cheap. The price was right. Yep. And then the next level is, um, you know, uh, your Smith & Wesson Colts and uh, there's someone else we could throw in there. But, you know, like the, the really baseline ARs, but it's a known brand. You get into something where, like, people in the command structure, like, they know what Colt is. I've heard of it. Yeah. They've, yeah. They've never heard of... Watched a Western. Yeah. They've never heard of Radian. You know, who's that? Yeah. Um, um, so you get into that kind of stuff, too. On the on the department issue side, and then and then it gets into the next level. It's like if we're above that, then it gets into well, what do the guys want, you know, and what are the biases of you know the sergeants and lieutenants involved with that team, you know, what are their trigger points, and then like is it, um, you know, so you can go kind of up, you know, taste some preferences there, and then also there's the politics of, you know, you brought up the MRAP example, there are like actually viable reasons that a law enforcement agency would need an MRAP. Oh, yeah. I, but as soon as that thing rolls out on the street, a whole other group of people say, militarization of the police. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Gonna, so, yeah. So muzzle device on this thing, you know, there probably is like a cool, like, gothic-styled, sharp, pointy something flash hider we could put on the end there. But if it's scary looking and we're giving it to people who are supposed to be protecting and serving the community, that's the optics the quote unquote optics of that politically aren't very good. So, Correct. you know, how do we, how do we issue them something that's, you know, does which the is job, kind of, it, you know, it's interesting kind of though, because like, I mean, let's really dive into what this end of the firearm does. Right. Well, we don't want to talk about that. You know? No. Yeah. yeah. Mark. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just feeling quit bringing logic into it. Now I just feel like yeah. an ass. Well, yeah. you should. Yep. So once you go, let's go back. Just go back the, to the, emotional. Whatever sharp making. pointy thing you want to put on the end of this, it's the thing I'm least afraid of <laughs> yeah. on the end of this. Right. Go back to making decisions emotionally, and <laughs> then we'll <Yeah>. talk. <laughs> but back to what I think you really wanted to talk about is like, so what? What kind of characteristics of a carbine would we want on something intended for that purpose, or well, what kind of things drive the bus on that? That was right? de- that was definitely like you said one of the original things that we wanted to get into here. But it also is funny now that I'm now that you've brought up, which is so true, a lot of the politics that get involved in the decision making around what gets used is like what becomes the next duty weapon. Yeah, and so many people what they don't realize is that like all these people that are then you know the private sector, the commercialized area of things, like all they want to do is have whatever is like duty cool, right? And they mm-hmm. think, they assume that all the decision making that went into what is the duty grade weapon was mm-hmm. based on all the things they're interested in. Mm-hmm. Whoever was the one making the decisions on that totally knew all about barrel lining and what it the, yeah. you know, like they picked a barrel length based on blah, 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 and they picked this and that, and it's got this on it because it, you know, makes them be able to, you know, kill aliens in case we get invaded, whatever. And little does a lot of people know, it's just like, no, it was the cheapest. Well, like, like, no, it just, uh, whoever decided on that, whoever made the decision just hated that other company. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, there's, there's a phase in my career, I was a heavy equipment operator. At no point, did anyone ever ask me, Adam, are, do you like Caterpillar or John Deere? No. Uh, they're like, this is the one we have. You're <laughs> running it. You will use this. Yeah. That, and that's that's how these decisions are made on the duty level. Right. You know, um, more often than not. There are, of course, departments where it's like, bring your own, and then you get some level of, of choice. Yeah, mm-hmm. really like uh, and in those cool. departments, people are like, oh, yeah, and those are the guys who have the most of those guys are buying the cheapest thing they can get. You know, um, the flashlight mounts on those are like the, the cheap Picatinny rail with the cheap, the cheapest light that lights up. Like that's the reality of what most of those are. Now there are like lots of dudes who are like sweet, but like the, you know, still, even if they get a choice, it doesn't always mean that they're choosing, you know, top shelf stuff again, right. because it's not their priority. Well, you know? Yeah, they're into they're into football or whatever. like guns aren't their thing. It's just something that's involved with their job. Yeah. Hmm. Should we talk about the coolest stuff again though? Now, yeah, like, yeah. Pretend, but back let's to just pretend, dude. That you know, back to like cool. so we took we took the same base gun, <laughs> um, and now like we're not we're not shooting three gun anymore. Um, some of the things the key differences are again that stock. So we picked I picked a more simplistic stock. 
um, because especially if you're starting to wear armor and stuff like that, um, more more these are more adaptable to sign up kind of kind of some of the unconventional um, positions that you end up in again because we kind of opened up our operating window a little bit yeah. compared to the norm in three gun. Now you can be in awkward positions in three gun. It's not normal though. Yeah, you're probably wearing a nice uh, athletic material polo Heck with yeah. a lot of sponsors printed all over it. Not yeah. necessarily mm. like a bright vest colors. Arm- yeah, bright colors. Bright colors. Yeah. Not necessarily vest, armor, play mm-hmm. carrier, jacket. Yeah. Yep. Um, more more likely than not, you're attaching a sling to it. So like uh, integrated sling cups is a thing. Or how do we attach a sling to this? That becomes important. I still shoot an enhanced trigger. Um, what uh, do you mean by enhanced trigger? Just something. It's it's uh got a pull that's probably less than four pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and breathed upon by smart people. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's your last physical control over the bullet. So I don't know why you wouldn't want that to be as clean and crisp as it could be. It is so critical. The, ar- the argument is, well, it's too light. I'll shoot it on accident. Why don't, is your finger in there? Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> why is your I've, safety off? I have I have forcefully dropped both of these guns, and they've not gone off, you know, um, more than once. Um, the trigger technology, now that, that philosophy came from a time where the way that people lightened up triggers was basically to make them not safe but what's currently available on the market they've they've designed a better mousetrap how do we give people a better trigger that's safe most of what's on the market falls into that category um i'm still pretty simple on the rails but you will you will start to see um uh you know the hand stops and the vertical grips and the angled grips um that's user preference. I think a lot of that comes from um, people who, where their job involves them holding it. You know, think of think of a guy who has to like stand at a checkpoint for a long time, like for hours. Um, it not not more the most ergonomic for shooting, but probably more ergonomic for standing here like this for a long time. Oh yeah, kind of sure. where some of that stuff. Oh, comes if you from. had like a vertical foregrip yep. on there and then or. Yep. Um, so you start to see those, but I mean, the more the more uh, performance driven uh, an end user is, the more you'll see them kind of move away from some of that stuff. Or if there's something on the gun where they're uh, they're trying to keep their hand away from it. So a really short gun, uh, like we went inside of ten inches. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll have hand stops on them so that they're sure that their hand is away from the muzzle. Yeah. Or, you know, they don't want their hand to, to slide all the way out and grab the suppressor. Uh, Nobody likes that. You know? oh, it even hurt to watch. Your uh, so cool light hot. that you got going on here, it's almost like this is a little hand stop there. It is. Uh, and I have I have uh, used that against barricades because uh, it's, it's serrated on this end, so it will give you a little traction okay. if you push on it. Look at that. Um, yeah, So, but then you get into... Um, so we're starting to add lights. I would say any... 2021 any any rifle that's being used for uh defensive or offensive purpose tends to have a white light on it and then uh the lighting technology has evolved to that we can put the light in a pretty out of the way place and then there's some pretty decent accessories for for buttons uh to uh to uh, activate them i think i disabled I like this that. one for that case is your battery dead no i uh i just turned the cap so that it doesn't doesn't burn the battery out oh, in, my, got uh, it. in my gun case. Um, so, so we got we can put the button in an ergonomic place, and then we can get the light out of our way. Uh, some of like uh, this particular one's made by Unity, um, and uh, this is a mod light on here. Um, the actual lighting, the actual like technology of the lights, has gotten way better. Even in the last like two years, <laughs> we start to need to cut through things like. Uh, start to talk about things like photonic barriers which aka smoke so if we have smoke oh. or or um, um, humidity hanging in the air mm-hmm. and then we hit it with a white light that turns into a visual obstruction mm-hmm. we need more light to punch through that to punch through what's reflecting back at us That's the answer more. so so the lights have gotten yeah um, so the lights probably get as hot as the suppressors if you leave them on long enough um, that's what you can say though. Next time you're at like the fire with everybody and the smoke's kind of going over to you and it's getting in your face. You can say, oh, this photonic barrier is getting in my yeah, face. so irritating. Super impressed. 
Yep. Um, yeah, platonic bears. That was follow the pretty one, right, Joe? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the muzzle devices tend to be flash hiders or um, uh, not muzzle brakes unless they're being covered up by a suppressor um, because they don't want as much concussion. Um, these rifles usually get shot in proximity to others, like someone within arm's reach of you, either because we got 10 to 20 dudes on a line doing an in-service training, or if they're in a, a CQB environment, a confined space, all of a sudden concussion is, is a thing. Um, so muzzle brakes are kind of frowned upon in that crowd. Uh, so you tend to see more uh, flash hiders in that in that realm. Frowned or, upon the crowd I roll with, too. Yeah. My, my crowd, not so much. We, we all have muzzle brakes. Um, oh, and then flash. You know, your gun having a flash... The thought is is that that gives uh, the person you were shooting at something to shoot back at, uh, which also is a big reason that suppressors are used, both to, to reduce muzzle blast and mitigate flash. Um, so suppressor use and flash hiders, more common in a duty-style gun. Um, and then I guess the other key characteristic of this one that differentiates it from the other ones, I started to use uh, grip panels on here because as the... As the uh, handguards got slimmer, we got closer to the barrel, but the barrel gives oh. off heat. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. In a in a in a competition setting, even if we rattle off forty rounds pretty quick, it's going to generate a bunch of heat, but we're not going to be holding on to it. You know, we're going to shoot it really fast and put it down, or the stage will be over. Um, in in the tactical side of the house, if you're like doing an in-service training, or you know. Um, people like our friends, uh, uh, like T-Rex or Black Iron Gunner, those tactical guys who are doing drills, like mm -hmm. they're going to go out and shoot a hundred rounds, like a workout, mm -hmm. like they're going to do X, Y, and Z really quick. Um, that even a hundred rounds shot in relatively quick succession, but over a period of time, it, the handguard's going to heat up to the point where it's uncomfortable to hold on to. Not, not like it's burning you, but like you're aware that it's changing temperature. Not fun. Yeah. Well, and plus, then you can't just throw the gun in a barrel. Like, right. I'll get back to that in a second. It's like, no, this is, yeah. you need to keep this. Yeah. So, even like, and even if you shoot like a short, if you shoot a short 10 round string, go and, go and score your target. Well, the, the heat is radiating off the barrel and the gas block into the handguard. So, your handguard is slowly heating up even in that short session, mm -hmm. just by nature of kind of what those folks do. And then if you're talking about, um, like if you're taking a two or three day carbine class at edge, well then, then you are going to be kind of be using this in a prolonged period. It's going to start to warm up and it's not going to cool all the way down before you start heating it back up again. So that's where we start putting uh, non-metal heat shields on here because the plastic doesn't heat up as quickly as the aluminum does. Yeah. And it, and it, uh, it deflects the heat somewhat um so it makes the handguard easier to hold on to yeah um so that tends to be some of the stuff that kind of goes into uh into duty grade guns and then they also start to mitigate size because we have to like fit them in patrol cars and move around in confined spaces and stuff like that so they tend to be shorter sure mm -hmm. so. now you've also got on this one and i don't blame you for not having it on this one because usually it's expensive as heck but uh like lasers and all that sort of thing too if, if you're a night vision person yeah then then you get into the lasers too um i don't have any setup that way i don't personally have any night vision but like i mean the, yeah. the edge guys do because they shoot a lot of night vision um so yeah an end user that would have be working in that realm they would also have that on here and that gets into some of also why they have these different buttons developed so that we can mm -hmm. because because a laser turns into kind of a big thing up here it makes it awkward to hold on to and then you get into the grips too like all of a sudden it's it's not just a handguard that you can wrap your hand around it's got other stuff it comes like playing to guitar like yes. you just gotta have a little bit of dexterity to know what yep. buttons you're pushing yeah the accessories on the duty gun side of the house are definitely heavy on the front end yeah, yeah. Yes. talk about your swing characters yes like getting all effed up which is another reason why they start to get shorter okay oh yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. so if you put big. yeah yeah if you put all that stuff on the end of an 18 inch gun way heavier than on the end of a 10 and a half inch gun yeah yeah it'd be like trying to hold a sledgehammer you know like and then you get and then you get uh flex too because the free floated handguard you're putting more weight on here and it's a longer lever mm -hmm. so the handguard itself loses some rigidity and starts to flex a little bit too mm. so so uh some of that stuff comes into play also 
I do like because there are actual quantifiable differences between the two, but I I do, you know, feel like somebody out there, like let's say, I mean, you you roll through how you might set a gun up like this. Somebody out there wants to have a, a gun that could be a home defense gun, and go to the competition. What would you air? What side would you air towards? Would you air towards just build more of like a duty grade style, or maybe not even build it, but just buy one? That has a good reputation as being like a good duty gun, mill LE, home defense, that sort of thing, mm-hmm. and then just use it in competition and deal with the with any little trade offs. You know, you might not be one of those top ten percent guys, mm-hmm. whatever. Or do you build some weird hybrid of these two in front of us? What what route do you go? Um, actually, that's not too far off of uh what I do. Um, like I say, you start with a with a solid base, something that has a good barrel something that has a good trigger or I would put a good trigger in it, um, a stock that you like, you know, a carbine stock that you like, a grip that you like. Um, and then um, what I do from there for the competition side of the house, I would use a muzzle brake, okay. but I would use a muzzle brake that's a host for a suppressor. Okay. So like, yeah. like in this in this rifle, that's why there's a dead air brake on the front of that. So you can pop a suppressor on it whenever yep. you want. Yep. So so when I had when I had a uh, uh, smaller smaller uh, collection, let's say you know it was it was doing more duties. Now as time has gone on, I you know as a collector specialize a little bit, specialize a little bit. But See, so, but yeah, so I'd put a muzzle brake on. That's a host for a suppressor, so you can cover both ends of the spectrum. Um, and then um, a light. But you could put a light on and not, you know, put it in a place that's either out of the way or has a, a more simplistic switch, so you don't have a lot of wires and stuff hanging off of it. Mm-hmm. But really, that's that's about it, and that's kind of why I brought these two out. They're not they're not that different. Yeah, I mean, you got different optics on them. Yeah. We didn't talk about on the duty gun. You've got a UH one holographic sight. Yep. But that's one of those things where it's like, I guess, how do they determine that in a duty gun? I mean, like. It's not like every guy rolling around a patrol car has six different ARs to choose from with different optics on top of each one. Oh, I mean, a lot of them are going now to low power variable because mm-hmm. of that very reason. Mm-hmm. They don't have multiple different guns to choose from at one given time. Mm-hmm. They can kind of do all the things. Well, and that ID part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, then that's a big part of our job in the LE sales department is is they're in the market for something. Either they're trading in what they have, or they need to evolve capability. And they're like, all right. We have a need. Here are here are our criteria. What fits into that criteria? Yeah. And based on what they say, that kind of drives the conversation of what we're gonna do, and also their budget. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. But like you said, in competition too. I mean, your optic can be determined based on what division you're in as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like that UH one might be great. You could literally take it off there and put it on this. It would still be considered a competition gun. It'd just yep. be for like limited division. Correct. So. Yeah, and then like vice versa, you could take the low power variable off your competition gun here for open class, throw it over here on the duty gun, and mm-hmm. no, be, no one would think anything of it. Like yep. that's not real. I mean, that would yep. actually be a really useful yep. right. setup for the most the most middle of the road of those would be um, a one to a one to six low power variable. So a yeah. Viper PST, a Razor Gen two, um, one of those would probably be if, again back in the spirit of bridging the gap, easiest. Um, the one gun to do it all, it would probably and did at one time have a one to six on it. Yeah. Oh. There you have it. So really, I'm, yeah, I feel like, I mean, basically this gun right here, it's like mm-hmm. a one to six on top, be yep. pretty dang good for about everything. Yep. And then uh, I'd say it just kind of comes down to the base. Now pick pick your flavor. These happen to be PWSs, but, I mean, any any of the major manufacturers, uh, they they have an, an optimized gas system. So, like, you get into, I would, I would choose an 11 and a half inch gun. But somewhere eleven and a half to fourteen five is probably where I'd be lengthwise, and then a good gas system to suit. Um, um, there's a lot of people who don't like adjustable gas systems. I do, but I would pick an intermediate setting. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, so a good reliable setting. But we so we've somewhat optimized the operating system of it. Um, but a good barrel, good operating parts. You know, that's really all you need, and then the rest of it. Most of the things that people get excited about and hotly debate are the the trimmings, which, the answer, which yeah. are kind of um, eleven and a half to fourteen and a half inch gun, Adam. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have to get an SBR thing for that tax stamp. I but do. Then you're gonna have to pay 
the government for something we shouldn't have to pay for, and you'll have to wait, so we just shouldn't do it at all. Just settle and get 16-inch guns all the time, right? There are people who think that. I don't agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you wouldn't. I was expecting Jim, a bigger reaction. Jim is like just over here trying to push buttons. I'm like just <laughs> on the bear, poking it. Yep. Um, yeah. Sweet. Com- comment period is open, though. Everyone should go go comment on arm braces. <laughs> comment period is open. <laughs> Put it uh, in the suggestion box. There is something about buying factory guns. Though. I know when I first got into ARs, I built a lot of them because I thought it was just, I was just like, oh, man, building them is so sick. And it was cool, and I think one of them, no, two of them actually work pretty good. <laughs> and the rest don't. The rest I haven't shot in forever. And then I was like, why would I ever build another one? It's so much better buying guns that somebody else built and made work, and it's their full-time job to make them work and mm-hmm. not mine in a closet at, you know, whatever, 10 o'clock at night. I guess you've gone down that path, Jim, but I do find that a little bit surprising because you love like tinkering and doing things and you're always working on that car. I never know what you're doing back there. <laughs> but uh the meatloaf. You're like the in cars you're the anti buy the complete car. Oh yeah. But I guess I'm I've become more when it comes to guns like the like they're like my phone. Yeah. I'm, I'm just work every time very would you? much yeah. Just would you yeah. I don't want to have to download the update. Just come with the update. Right. And that's and that's where I think a lot of these are at I, yeah, there was there was a period in these where there was a, you know, the technology was advancing pretty quickly, but you've also seen that a lot of the really successful companies that have survived for a while they kind of arrived at similar stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they know? did. So I mean, they kind of arrived at similar gas systems. They kind of use similar barrels. They kind of use similar handguards. And I feel like a lot of the companies that are like really like known for making quality stuff, they're very successful. They're oftentimes used. Uh, in many different, I guess, all over competition to Mogadishu. Uh, They usually come out with one really good thing, and it lasts for a while. It's not like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I bought this thing this month, and in three months, now I have to upgrade everything because that's obsolete. Now in another three months, that's obsolete. Usually there's like, oh no, this works for like five years. and then Yeah, I mean, look, just look at it from the perspective of time. Like, look at how long these guys have been in the AR game, building commercial ARs. They're good at it. Yeah. It's their job. They're doing it every day. Yeah. Well, and I think also, like, if you look at... And I'm not anti. I mean, actually, every AR our own is kind of pieced together. But but even, even if you just look at the sport from the outside, like, if you watched trap shooting in the Olympics on TV, like, you could easily watch that sport and be like, I need a $5,000 gun to shoot trap. But if you go to your local trap club, what are you going to see on the racks? You're going to see a bunch of 1187s and 870s and Mossberg pumps. And, you know, you're going to see a lot of field grades, you know, a lot of normal stuff. And it's the same thing at a competition. Like, yes, if you, if you look the people who are very visible in the sport of three gun, they, they can shoot some exotic stuff. They, you know, they've been in the sport for a while, so they kind of like it to be like fun colors. But if you go to a match and see like the bulk of the sport, the, the enthusiasts who are participating, it's fairly, it's fairly rack grade stuff. I mean, it's, yeah. they went to a gun store and bought it just like you. Um, so you could kind of see there's a separation between perception of reality and then what actually reality is. Reality is, is that most of the ARs shot in three gun are fairly basic 14 to 16 to 18 inch guns with, you know, stuff that you can buy out of a, out of a Brown Ells catalog is mm-hmm. what most of them are. So competition guns and duty guns unite. Yep. Maybe you're not so different after all, Jim. Look at that. Something we might have actually brought together in the year 2021. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Um, well, Adam, fantastic information as usual. I'm surprised the Cold War didn't come up, but uh, hmm. maybe next, next time. time we could talk about it. I'm sure we could next time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks to everybody out there as usual who listens along. Uh, if you have any co- comments about, you know, comp 
comp guns versus duty guns or whatever, what you're using, what works for you, uh, if you found the magical equation for the perfect do-it-all gun, uh, shoot us a comment for that in uh, the comments here on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube or over on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Otherwise, we'll just see you on the next podcast. Thanks for listening, yeah. as usual. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Never everybody, for realize, having me, guys. Ever realize how many times we said thanks for listening? Mark, I mean, we're up there. We're in the hundreds now. I know. It's been and, a while. And you know what? We mean it every time. We do. We really appreciate it. Thank you, it. everybody. And we thank you for the comments and how many topic shows suggestions. There been? There's been, like, if you include 10 minute talks, we're like over 300. We're approaching, like, we, there's a lot of good in information. The out there. Oh, wow. It's kind of like an era. <sighs> Could be. I don't the know. show's starting to have its own gravity. Look out. I hope so. Stay grounded. <laughs> 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 All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.